Hi, my name is Connie Kuklanis and you're watching the video Fourth Cranial Nerve Palsy, Knapp's Classification. In 1971, Philip Knapp devised a classification for fourth nerve palsies. And this classification primarily takes into account the position of maximum deviation. In previous videos, we've discussed the principles of incompetence to business and have talked about how the maximum deviation is in the field of action of the paretic muscle. However, with the fourth nerve palsy, this does vary. And it's important that you carefully measure the deviation in each position of gaze to determine where the deviation is greatest, as this will inform surgical management. Before we move on, I would just like to acknowledge Zoran Jojewski, who some years ago put together most of the case studies that you'll see in this particular video. NAP's classification includes seven classes, and we'll go through each of these individually. Just to note that the examples in this video are all related to a right superior oblique palsy, unless otherwise stated. So what you'll see in this video can be translated directly to a left superior oblique palsy, even though our discussion will focus around right superior oblique palsy. Okay, class one. In this particular instance, the right hyperdeviation is greatest in the direction of the action of the ipsilateral antagonist. So here we have an example of nine positions of gaze. This is right gaze, this is left gaze, and we have a right on left, and the measurements here all reflect vertical, uh, the vertical deviation or the right on left. And if you look at the figures, or the measurements, we see that the greatest deviation is here in labo elevation, where the right inferior oblique has its action, where the ipsilateral antagonist has its action. So what we see here is that the inferior oblique overaction is greater than the superior oblique underaction. Let's have a look at an image. Okay, here we have a patient with a class one superior oblique palsy. Looking at prior position, uh, it's very difficult to say where there's a deviation there, but by a fraction, it appears to me there might be a right on left. When the patient looks over into left gaze, we can see this right on left has increased. Now, looking up here, the inferior oblique is clearly overacting, and when we look down in this position, the superior oblique is underacting. However, if you compare the underaction of the superior oblique with the overaction of the inferior oblique, the inferior oblique overaction is greater than the superior oblique underaction, which is causing the deviation to be greatest in LAVO elevation. This is the class one fourth nerve palsy. In class two, we now have the right hyper greatest in the direction of action of the palsied right superior oblique. So as we would expect on the basis of the principles of incompetence to business. We have a look at the values here. Um, we can see that the greatest right on left is in Levo depression, where the action of the right superior oblique takes place. Indeed, this actually is the most common uh, superior oblique class. Looking at a patient now in primary position, we seem to have a slight right on left and perhaps an exo as well there in that position. And as the patient looks over to left gaze, again, we see the right on left in this position. As the patient looks up, there is perhaps a mild inferior oblique overaction. Uh, we need to perform a cover test. And in this position, we can clearly see the superior oblique underaction here. So in this particular instance, the greatest deviation is in dextroid depression, uh, which is why it's classified as a class two. Class three. Now we're going to find that the right hyperdeviation is greatest along the entire contralateral left gaze position. So there's little difference between uh, labor elevation, labor version, and labor depression, which we see here. We see the values of 22, 25, and 18. The deviation is clearly much larger in left gaze than in right gaze or primary. And we're suspecting now that we probably have an inferior oblique overaction and a superior oblique underaction that is similar. This young boy has a class 3 superior oblique palsy and in primary position we can see the right hyperdeviation. 
in left gaze again we see the right on left up here we see the right on left and down in labor and depression we see the right on left the hyper deviation is similar across these three positions which is why it's classified as a class three class four we now have a right hyper deviation that's greatest across all of down gaze and contralateral gaze so you can see here that the entire down gaze is quite large as is contralateral gaze now why do we have a large vertical deviation in dextro depression a position where the right superior oblique and the family of muscles involved in the muscle sequelae don't act you recall from one of the previous videos that I briefly discussed the fact that a long-standing fourth nerve palsy can cause a tight superior rectus so in this example we would have a long-standing right superior oblique palsy that's caused this constant right hyper deviation and the superior rectus has become tight over time now a tight muscle acts like a mechanical restriction which means that as the eye attempts to move down the superior rectus will be holding it back from being able to achieve full down gaze so what we see is the right or left continue in down gaze and in all positions of down gaze you see below here that only three percent of patients actually have a class for superior oblique palsy so it's not very common but you need to be aware of why a patient may have a right on left that continues to be quite large in the opposite field of gaze unfortunately I don't have an image of a patient with a class 4 but what you would expect is if I take you back to the patient here we would expect to see this right on left that continues here to continue across in this particular position too so here we don't see a right on left we would see a right on left continue and over here we move the patient and the right on left would continue in this position also not only that but it would be similar in size to that which we see in this position here moving on to class 5 here we now have the deviation being greatest along the entire down gaze so this is the position where the right superior oblique is acting however again we've got the continued large right on left along down gaze this is usually caused by the ipsilateral superior rectus being tight as we saw in class 4. now this patient has a class 5 superior oblique palsy and what we see here is in prior position she might have a small right hyper deviation difficult to tell in left gaze we see that there is a slight right on left up here in uh, labo elevation there is again a slight right on left and here we have the greatest right on left so far we can see that it's being caused by that um, that super oblique under action there as we move across here we see that that right on left continues and as we move across here the right on left um, continues here as well and is actually the greatest right on left we have um, in these positions that we've uh, considered so far so in looking at this patient the greatest right on left is across the entire down gaze and these two positions here are only mildly affected which is why this patient doesn't have a class 4 and rather is uh, classified as a class 5 class 6 is the bilateral superior oblique palsy in which instance we expect to see the clinical features that we discussed in the previous video and finally class 7 this is also known as canine tooth syndrome the reason it's also called canine tooth syndrome is that it has been associated with dog bites and class 7 is associated with trauma to the trochlea it doesn't have to be a dog bite it can be any type of trauma and sometimes it can even be a penetrating injury that affects the trochlea now the fact that the there is trauma to the superior oblique causes two issues one it will cause a right superior oblique palsy and we'll see a right superior oblique under action as per usual however the trauma will also cause damage to the trochlea such that there will be a mechanical restriction 
as the patient attempts to elevate an adduction. Let's have a look at the patient here to the right. This patient is looking into left gaze. This is laboversion, labo elevation, labo depression. In laboversion, we have possibly a small right on left in this particular position of gaze. As we come down, we can see clearly the right superior oblique under action as we usually would in a superior oblique palsy. It's actually quite marked. There's quite a large under action um, in this position causing a large right on left. Now, Usually a right superior oblique palsy will cause in the opposite position of gaze, or I should say left uh, labor elevation, an inferior oblique overaction. But we're not seeing a right inferior oblique overaction here. What we're seeing is an underaction of the inferior oblique. We've actually got reversal of height here. This is a left on right as compared to the right on left in this particular instance. This reversal of height is caused by a mechanical restriction. The trochlea has been damaged in such a way that it's not allowing that eye to elevate in adduction. This is not actually documented or shouldn't be documented as a right inferior oblique palsy. This is a Brown syndrome. A Brown syndrome is a limitation of elevation in adduction that's caused by a restriction of the superior oblique. So it's the superior oblique not allowing the eye to elevate. It's not the actual inferior oblique that's the problem. Another note to make is that the superior oblique underaction and the Brown syndrome can vary in their extent or magnitude. So if we have a look in this particular instance, you could make a call as to whether the superior oblique palsy is worse than the Brown syndrome. And in this instance, we call it as the superior oblique being worse than the Brown syndrome. You would have measurements to support that diagnosis. This is the exception where the patient has a left superior oblique palsy as compared to all the other classes I've shown you so far, which have been right superior oblique palsies. So the problem we're finding is in right gaze now, and we have a large left on right, 20 diopters, in uh, dextro depression, which is being caused by that left superior oblique under. And then when we take the patient up into dextro elevation, we see reversal of height. We now have a right on left. We have a brown syndrome in dextro elevation. So here we have a combination of the superior oblique palsy and the brown syndrome. And we have the superior oblique being greater or the palsy or underaction or limitation of the superior oblique is greater than the limitation produced by the Brown syndrome. Again, reiterating this patient is a class 7 who has a superior oblique palsy that's greater than the limitation of the Brown syndrome. Let's look at a patient in the reverse who has a Brown syndrome that's greater than the superior oblique palsy. So the left superior oblique having been damaged. And what we see is that there's a left on right in most positions of gaze, but the greatest deviation is in dextra elevation, where the left inferior oblique has its action. And we can see here reversal of height, and we can see that in this instance we have the greatest deviation of all nine positions of gaze. Now in this particular example, it's worth noting that because the Brown syndrome is so large, it's actually affected more positions than just dextra elevation, but we've got a cross up gaze, and also here in dextroversion, we have a right on left as compared to the left on right in all other positions. Let's have a look at a patient with a class seven where the Browns is greater than the superior oblique palsy. So here is a patient with a right class seven superior oblique palsy, in prior position, there might be a left on right, difficult to say, uh, just looking at the photographs without a cover test. When we move over into left gaze, we actually have a left on right here. Now in this position here, just we have a right on left being caused by the superior oblique under. And when we take the patient up, we have clearly what appears to be an inferior oblique under action, but is a Brown syndrome. Now for this patient, the Brown syndrome here is much greater than the um, superior oblique under action here. And because of this, 
we actually have the left on right in dextroversion rather than the right on left, which would have been driven by a larger superior oblique underaction. So class seven looks very different to all other classes of superior oblique palsies. You have two opposing limitations. You have a limitation in adduction in elevation, and you have a limitation of depression in adduction. So in summary, I've provided you here with a diagrammatic uh, representation of NAPS classifications of the superior oblique palsy. You will often see in various textbooks NAPS classifications being depicted in these sort of grid formats. So what we're seeing here is essentially nine positions of gaze. This is primary, this is uh, left gaze, right gaze, and then we have elevation depression in these particular positions. So for class one, what we have depicted here is that the greatest deviation is in the field of action of the ipsilateral antagonist. For class two, we have the greatest deviation in the field of action of the superior oblique. In class three, we have the greatest deviation along the entire contralateral field of gaze. In class four, we have not only the contralateral field of gaze being affected, but also all of down gaze has a similarly sized uh, deviation or vertical deviation. In class five, down gaze has the greatest uh, vertical deviation. Class six is our bilateral superior oblique. And class seven is the canine tooth syndrome, where we have a limitation of elevation in adduction and a limitation of depression in adduction. And we have reversal of height between those two positions. Okay, this particular grid clearly indicates a right superior oblique palsy. So if you were to translate this into a left superior oblique palsy, just quickly with class one, for instance, it would be this position here where the class one would be, um, would have the greatest vertical deviation in class two, here we would have the greatest uh, deviation and so on and so forth. Okay, that brings us to the conclusion of this video. Thank you for watching.